that's terrific. So it's four o'clock your time. Are we ready to go? Okay, so thank you so much for letting me join you guys today. I'm going to do a presentation about uh, a project called the Salish Sea Marine Survival Project. Um, this is a, a research program that is a joint U.S.-Canada effort to try to figure out why uh, salmon and steelhead juveniles are dying in the marine environment as soon as they leave our rivers and let you know a little bit about why it matters. Um, for this presentation, I'm going to talk about some salmon life history, the background on salmon here in the Pacific Northwest, um, <clears throat> some of the problems that we've been having with them, a uh, particular problem related to marine survival, and then what a group of researchers in the U.S. and Canada are doing about it. Uh, this, this research is ongoing. You can track it on our website and via um, Facebook posts from Long Live the King's Facebook page. A little bit about me, I am uh, Jacques White. I am a former uh, oceanographic researcher who now works on salmon and steelhead recovery efforts in the Pacific Northwest. I grew up here in Washington State, uh, was a, uh, grew up along the shoreline, spent a lot of time going in, in the water, uh, looking at things that are growing on the beach, catching fish. Um, grew up, moved away, lived in Louisiana for a while and, and in Maryland where I did research and, and studied and got uh, higher degrees. Um, you don't have to grow up on the shoreline to want to become an oceanographer. Two of my best friends and colleagues when I was uh, in a graduate program at the University of Maryland were from, the, one was from Nashville, Tennessee, and the other was from St. Louis. They had a deep passion for the shoreline and they used to go and collect seashells and grew up to become oceanographers and they're quite successful. So uh, there are a bunch of varied backgrounds that <clears throat> You can go into this field if you want to. Um, so I uh, am speaking to you from my office here in Seattle, Washington, and I'm going to give you some context about where we are and why this work is important. Um, the first picture I want to show you is, well, it's uh, supposed to go forward. There we go. Um, this is a map of the northwest corner of the United States, Washington State, and the southwest corner of Canada. And there are two inland bodies of water that are connected here. To the south uh, in Washington State is a body of water called Puget Sound. And to the north is a body of water called the Strait of Georgia. And together, uh, these have been named by uh, scientists in the region as the Salish Sea. And that is because uh, the people who were here, the Aboriginal people, the Native Americans who lived here spoke the Salish language and everybody in this region uh, spoke the same language and traded together and <clears throat> uh, so that's why we call this the Salish Sea. Um, you can see that the, the red areas are where population growth is the greatest and it's focused in Canada to the north in the Vancouver, British Columbia area and in the south it's focused along the east coast of Puget Sound, you can see lots of red on the right side of the, of the body of water here, um, with Seattle being right about in the center, right about here. I don't know if you can see that, but um, this is the region that we're talking about. Because of all the development here, uh, lots of the salmon populations have been uh, put at risk, and to replace natural habitat that's been damaged, we now have significant hatchery production that replaces that and that hatchery production supports fisheries. It can also uh, harm the wild populations by outcompeting the wild fish for resources. So uh, when we talk about salmon, we're referring to 11 or salmonids in Washington state. There are 11 different species from the uh, pygmy whitefish, which is a rather small uh, trout that lives in the mountains to the mighty Chinook salmon, which can attain sizes of 80 to 100 pounds after living for, say, up to eight or nine years in the Pacific Ocean. Um, for this talk, uh, with respect to the marine survival work, we're going to be talking about Chinook, and we're also going to be focusing on coho, which is another salmonid. I should note that both Chinook salmon and coho salmon die after they return to spawn. 
Uh, and we're also going to be talking about steelhead trout, which is essentially an ocean-going rainbow trout. So salmon have a very complex life history. Uh, the most simple of the species that we're talking about is coho, which return from the ocean in the fall. Uh, they spawn in freshwater environments, and their juveniles rear in rivers for a year and a half and then go to sea uh, and spend uh, another two years uh, rearing in the ocean and, and return to spawn again. Again, those, those die. Chinook salmon have a much more complicated life history. They can return any time from late spring through late fall. Uh, they will rear in the river once their eggs are hatched after they spawn for anywhere from uh, a few months to uh, a year and a half, like coho. Uh, and, then, and they can stay in their marine environment from anywhere from one year to nine years. And the very large fish tend to come back after many years. Steelhead trout have the most complicated life history. Uh, they rear in rivers <clears throat> uh, anywhere from uh, two years to go to sea, or many of them uh, will just stay in the river and become resident rainbow trout. In the marine environment, they can go to the marine environment for a few months in coastal waters or go far out into the ocean and come back after a very long time. All of this diversity that these fish uh, display is very useful for when you have bad uh, conditions in the freshwater environment or bad conditions in the marine environment. By hedging, by the fish hedging their bets and having many different life histories, uh, they can overcome bad uh, conditions in one area or another and persist over a very long period of time. These fish have been uh, swimming in these waters for hundreds of thousands of years in the Pacific Northwest. Um, as you probably can imagine, if these are anadromous fish, meaning they, they spawn in freshwater and go to sea, River habitat is critically important for spawning. It's also important for rearing of fish and, uh, and uh, hiding and feeding before they go to sea. Uh, but as I mentioned, Chinook salmon can spend up to eight years in the marine environment. So the marine environment is at least equally as important as freshwater environments, but we know much less about what the fish do there and what helps them to survive. So this project is very focused on their time in the marine environment, and we'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, historically, there were a lot of salmon in the Pacific Northwest. When European people of European descent first came to Washington State and started to exploit these in the late 19th and early 20th century, uh, this, this is an old postcard of an old photo that says 30 million fish caught Puget Sound, Washington. Uh, we don't have harvests like that anymore and it's for a number of reasons. Uh, in addition to there being a lot of fish, fish were quite big, and the average size, this is a Chinook salmon here, probably 60, 70 pounds. The average size of salmon of all species has gone down over time due to a number of factors, food resources, uh, special harvest on, on the larger and, and older fish, uh, but the result is that we have much smaller salmon now. Another thing that has changed is salmon diversity. Now, this is a figure that shows the blue bars are what we would call early run Chinook returning to the Green River, uh, and the, the white bars are late run Chinook, uh, which tend to, be, tend to be reared in hatcheries. <clears throat> the, the dotted line is just the uh, total abundance of fish that are returning to this river, and you can see that has, got, that has not changed much over time. But if you look at the proportion of early run fish to late fish starting in 1975 where this graph starts, you can see it's roughly equal. There's an equal abundance. Over time, uh, that, ha that situation has changed and now we have quite a bit fewer of the early run fish and many more of the late run fish. So this system has now become dominated by late run uh, hatchery fish principally. Um, and so this is a, a trend that is occurring throughout Puget Sound, and this loss of diversity is critically important because this means that the resilience of these salmon to uh, changes in climate or maybe global warming uh, or natural catastrophes like droughts or floods or uh, volcanic eruptions or even in the long run uh, a, an ice age will be reduced. And so we will talk a little bit about what we might do to address this as a restoration action. Um, one of the things that, that we'll note is that Puget Sound White, in fact, throughout the entire Salish Sea, including, including British Columbia, the overall abundance of salmon returning to the region started to fall off precipitously in 1984.
So this figure shows uh, the abundance of Chinook returning to both uh, the U.S. and Canada, Canada from 1984 through 2010, and you can see there's a steady decline. Over the same period of time, managers, uh, in an attempt to address the issue, reduced harvest significantly from somewhere between eight and 900,000 fish a year to somewhere between 150 and 200,000 fish. You would think that by reducing uh, the harvest by that dramatic amount, it would have resulted in an increase in spawners returning to the rivers. Um, and I should also note that uh, in, 2000, in 1999, Chinook salmon, uh, which are the, the salmon species that's, that's the focus here, were listed under the Endangered Species Act because the population had fallen below what the federal government managers thought was a sustainable level. But even with that significant increase or decrease in fishing pressure, we saw only a slight increase in the number of spawning Chinook in the Salish Sea rivers uh, from 1994 to 2010. So why is this? Why did we see this chain, this uh, large change in fishing pressure, but, but no change in abundance? What is it that is causing the problem for salmon that is not allowing them to return? Well, that is the point of this project. What we have seen in Puget Sound and the Strait of Georgia, which is different than on the coast, is a significant decline in marine survival. And when we say marine survival, we mean the percentage of adults that return uh, as a function of the total number of juvenile fish or smolts that leave their rivers and go into the marine environment. So you can see that on the top picture, which is for photo or for coho, I'm sorry, that the uh, abundance in both the Strait of Georgia and Puget Sound, of re or the percentage of returning fish, fell off quite significantly during the 1980s and has stayed low. If you look at the coastal river to the right, you can see that the, while the trend is up and down, there is no significant decline really over that same period. For Chinook, the same thing. Starting about 1984, the population uh, uh, was affected by reduced marine survival. Uh, to the right, you can see for coastal stocks, including the large stock leaving the Columbia River, no real trend. For steelhead, the decline was perhaps even more dramatic uh, during this period, at least in Puget Sound. And while the coastal rivers showed a decline in marine survival, uh, what, they, what they also show is that it, it recovered to some degree in, in the decade from 2000 to 2010, uh, which was not observed in Puget Sound. So what's going on? What is different about Puget Sound in the Strait of Georgia, or what we call the Salish Sea, and what is going on out on the coast. Also, you could say, well, well, if this is just marine survival, <clears throat> maybe that survival is a uh, problem with survival is occurring in the Salish Sea, or it is occurring out in the ocean. And the reason we think it's in the Salish Sea, at least one of the reasons, is that we tagged some steelhead with acoustic tags, which will send out a signal, and as that fish swims through Puget Sound, uh, different arrays of receivers on the bottom will pick up that signal and we can count the numbers of fish that are tagged that are going by. And what we find is that year after year, uh, we are losing a lot of these fish before they even reach the Strait of Juan de Fuca. So long before the fish uh, get to the Pacific Ocean, they are declining significantly. So you can see the, the little uh, pie chart up here shows that only about 15% or less of the uh, tagged steelhead are showing up at those at the array of sensors in the Strait of Juan de Fuca, while we have 100% at the mouth of the Nisqually River uh, deep in South Puget Sound. So this looks like really, really high rates of mortality very early in their life in the marine environment. So this is a, what we call a Salish Sea-wide anomaly. This isn't just something that's happening in Puget Sound. It turns out that the, the Canadian uh, scientists are finding the same thing there. Um, but there are other significant changes that have gone on in Puget Sound during this period of time. Uh, ling cod, true cod, rockfish, or what we call bottom fish, uh, herring, or what we call forage fish, some species of zooplankton, and kelp have all declined significantly over the same period. But on the other hand, harbor seals, harbor porpoises, pink salmon, which is another species of anadromous salmon, jellyfish, temperature and human population have all increased. So we're, what we're trying to do is to look and see is, are there factors related to the environment, things related to human population, uh, perhaps predation, changes in food resources that could have affected the marine survival of salmon and steelhead, and perhaps also affected some of these other species that have declined over the same time. 
<clears throat> so what would affect a juvenile salmon if we're sort of thinking about principles? Well, uh, clearly food resources would affect them, and the food resources are driven largely by ocean conditions and the climate and how that affects the, the nutrients available to phytoplankton. Phytoplankton uh, grow in response to climate ch changes in climate and changes in season. Uh, this, this phytoplankton or plant plankton is then eaten or grazed upon by zooplankton, uh, little crustaceans, or uh, fish larvae, and that those become food resources for juvenile salmon. We call uh, control of salmon production from the bottom or from food resources bottom-up control. There's also uh, things that control them from the top down that actually directly uh, affect their health or fitness. One of those could be diseases. Uh, another is, of course, direct predation by marine mammals, birds, or other fish. So let's examine some of the factors that might be controlling uh, bottom-up production of food resources for juvenile salmon. One of those is climate, and have we had a, a directed change of climate that coincides with the reduced marine survival of salmon and steelhead? This figure shows the surface temperature in a portion of Puget Sound uh, that has been collected. This is a really fantastic data set because what it shows is that somebody went out and measured the temperature from the second month or February of 1920 through uh, December of 2012. So this is a continuous monthly temperature record and what it shows if the months progress across the, the bottom of the axis and the years progress on, on the, the left side going up is that there are changes and you have hot years and you have cold years. And you can see that there are groups of hot years, say between 1930 and 1940, and then maybe a decade period between the 1940s and the 1960s, where temperatures were relatively cool in the summer, a warm period around 1960 to, to the mid-1960s, and then a protracted cold period from, say, 1965 to 1980. This change in the environment that lasts for several, several uh, years, in fact, several decades even, is something called the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And this uh, climate cycle has been going on, as far as we can tell, if we look at things like um, pollen records or, or plankton records in sediments that are preserved in the bottom of the ocean, we can see that this has been occurring off and on from, for many, many years. What you will notice, though, is that right around 1980, we went into a warm phase, and we really haven't come out of it yet. We are stuck in what I would call the warm phase of the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. Well, that coincides just about exactly with the reduction in marine survival of salmon and steelhead. So is that the problem? Well, there are other factors. One of those is the harbor seals um, or potential, potential predators. So if you look at the uh, smolt survival of a species of salmon called coho, you can see that it has declined from 1975 till after 2005. If we overlay the abundance of seals in the region uh, with that, we can see that the seals have increased at the same time that the juvenile salmon survival has decreased. So is this uh, a correlation? In other words, are these related inversely, or is it just um, an, a coincidence? So we are uh, thinking that maybe we should take a look at this as part of our study. So the, that's a really good question. So Lauren R. has asked the question, why the abundance of seals? In 1975, uh, we, Congress passed the Marine Mammal Protection Act, which meant that it was illegal to harass or harm marine mammals like seals and whales. Um, what used to happen in our region, and, and I'm sorry if this sounds mean, is that people with fishing interests used to shoot the seals and the sea lions to keep them from getting into their fishing nets and causing problems. And, competing with people for, for fish. Uh, once we stopped that practice, the seals uh, increased in abundance, and now we've gone from about 5,000 seals in Puget Sound to something like uh, 40, 40,000 seals. So it's increased by about eight or nine times. Uh, quite a big increase, and the question would be, is that enough to impact juvenile salmon? So what other kind of, there might be other predators that are also causing, turns out that harbor porpoises have also increased over that time. That's a small porpoise that lives as native to the Salish Sea. There are also birds that might be preying on them and then also uh, other fish, including adult salmon that live in the basin might be preying on juvenile salmon, maybe particularly of other species. 
So what else might be causing this? Well, disease might be a problem. There are a number of salmon farms, uh, salmon pens, that are located in the upper portion of the Strait of Georgia up in Canada. Many thousands, hundreds of thousands, and even millions of salmon are produced in these pens. There are problems with diseases that, that must be controlled in these different environments. And so one of the ideas is that maybe diseases are being transferred from fish farming, uh, net pen facilities to wild fish as they migrate out. So that's another thing that we're looking for. There also may be diseases in native rivers that are occurring and increasing because of changes in the climate here while the environment warms. Well, what about development? This river that's in the foreground here, it looks like a port, but this is actually a salmon river, and this is the salmon river that I showed that diversity data for. This is the Green Duwamish River, which empties into Puget Sound through uh, the industrial area of Seattle. This used to be a 5,300-acre estuary or salt marsh, and what happened is there used to be a, a hillside in Seattle, about the same size as the one that you see behind the Space Needle, that was located between downtown and uh, what's called Queen Anne Hill that was completely leveled with big hydro, hydro, hydraulic pumps and all of the material was sent down to the lower part of the city via railroad cars and dumped in here to make the port. Um, the Seahawks, the Sounders and the Mariners all play in this area uh, just south of the downtown. Uh, this is all very low elevation but it used to be marsh and now it is uh, industrial area. This can have a significant impact, particularly if there's toxic materials entering the system uh, on the health for salmon. Also, salt marshes were a lot better places for salmon to feed and hide than deep water ports. I mentioned that we have significant hatchery production. At this point uh, in, in our history, 75% of all of the Chinook salmon that come back to Puget Sound and to the Columbia River are originate in hatcheries. And so hatchery production is a really big factor in managing and maintaining fisheries, particularly in places that, like the Columbia River that have a number of hydroelectric, hydroelectric dams. The problem with hatcheries is that they tend to create one kind of fish. We find a fish that grows well in a hatchery and we release them. And it reduces the diversity uh, of the salmon that are entering the system. So if we send all these salmon out together at the same time, perhaps their survival is being impacted because predators or they miss, the, they miss the appropriate food window or they're providing a huge signal to predators and attracting more predation on them than would be if they came out of the river uh, in small numbers over a longer period of time. So what do we do about this? Well, <clears throat> my organization, Long Live the Kings, and our partners, the Pacific Salmon Foundation, which is a nonprofit organ, we're both nonprofit organizations. We operate in Washington State and in the U.S., and the Pacific Salmon Found, uh, Foundation operates in British Columbia, decided to put together a large group of scientists to try to address this issue. So this program consists of 150 uh, uh, individual, more than 150 individual scientists working on the project, more than 60 organizations. We're raising $20 million to do this research. Uh, the research is gonna last five years, at least initially. And we have one question. What are the primary factors affecting juvenile, Chinook, coho, and steelhead survival in the Salish Sea? Here's a, just a few of the partners, but you can see that we're working with the most important state agencies. And in Canada, we're working with the Department of Fisheries and Oceans. Uh, in the US, we're working with NOAA, which is the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the Federal Fisheries Agency, also working with EPA. And then we're working with state organizations like uh, the Washington State Department of Fish and Wildlife. And as you can see uh, on the right side of this graph or this chart, there are many Indian tribes. We have 26 sovereign Indian nations that operate in Washington State and many more that are uh, operating and functioning in Canada. They have tribal treaty rights to these fish. They are extremely interested in maintaining uh, healthy salmon populations and high productivity. So why, why are nonprofit organizations involved? Well, our unique role is to coordinate this effort, uh, to facilitate the scientists, make sure that, the meeting, the, the, that we meet regularly, that we understand who's doing what, uh, to, to track the work. We do the fundraising. We're raising the $20 million for this. Uh, we do communications like I'm talking to you folks right now. Um, we integrate with other programs. In, in other words, we work with people that are working on habitat restoration, 
and water quality improvement that are, are uh, relevant for, for our program. And, and another maybe most critical thing is that when this research is done and we get some answers, we will work to build a connection between the science and the management agencies that actually have to implement and try to improve our salmon populations in the Pacific Northwest. The objectives of this project are to advance wild salmon recovery and sustainable fisheries. Um, what we really want to answer is what's happened since the 1980s in terms of juvenile Chinook coho and steelhead survival. Also, uh, we want to assist in, in improving the accuracy of adult return forecasting and better understanding the survival of the juveniles as they go out can give us an indication of how many fish are likely to return later for fisheries. So our hypothesis are, remember, bottom-up processes. That means, is there enough food for these fish? Top-down processes, are, are, is predation contributing to the reduction of survival? And then there's other factors like diseases, uh, toxics in the marine environment, or habitat degradation, particularly in estuarine areas. Um, ultimately, there's kind of two uh, ways that, that um, there, there's two primary factors that, that we can be faced with. One is that, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> the biggest problem is local. It's something to do with our influence here. It's hatchery production. It's toxics that we're putting in the environment. It's habitat loss, and we can correct that. It may also be that this is a result of, of um, global warming or some kind of natural ocean cycles, in which case we can't change that very quickly from our management roles here in the Pacific Northwest, but we can maybe adapt to it by, change, by increasing the diversity of our natural and hatchery populations so they're better able to, con, to handle different conditions. In any case, we think there's something that can be done once we understand what the problem is. So the way uh, the basic research approach is to try to understand what the fish are telling us. So we track them, follow them as they leave the rivers, measure their size, look at what they're eating, uh, try to evaluate what their growth rates are and determine what is the health of these populations uh, based on looking at the fish. We're also looking at what are the food resources that support them, what is the prey, the predator field that they're entering into, and then what are some of the um, integrated modeling or climate impacts that, that we can try to look at historic, the historic data and also model into the future about what we're likely to see. So taking all these factors into consideration, we put together a major research project. So with respect to the modeling, we've looked at the historic data of coho, steelhead, and Chinook marine survival. That's that graph I showed you early on with the, that, that showed that marine survival had to decline quite a bit. Um, we're also looking at things like trends in zooplankton, wind stratification, and then we're developing models so we can project this uh, outcomes forward based on different climate conditions that, that we might see or different uh, nutrient inputs, et cetera. Uh, bottom up, we're, we're looking at the growth of the salmon and whether or not they have enough food to eat. There's a citizen science program that's been launched in the Strait of Georgia where people go out in their individual boats and work with scientists to collect data. And we've initiated a Puget Sound wide zooplankton program where we're evaluating zooplankton. This particular um, organism here is a crab larvae. So this is what a juvenile Dungeness crab looks like um, before it uh, turns into a crab shaped animal and settles on the bottom. These things swim in the water column and are, are fish for or food for juvenile fish. Turns out very important food right now. So looking at where we're actually okay, somebody wants access to the PowerPoint. I'll, I'll try to make that available through Yo Oceans if I can. Um, maybe we'll post it on our website. I'll, I'll uh, address that at the end. Anyway, uh, growth and survival. So we're building out from, from rivers. Um, and these are the areas that we're sampling in Washington State intensively. And we also have a series of sites where we're evaluating the fish when they come out of the river in what we call the nearshore marine environment in shallow water that you could wade in or a little bit deeper, and then offshore in deeper uh, marine habitats. But we're really focusing in these uh, large inland bodies of water. Um, this is the kind of uh, sampling that we're doing. So every one of these blue dots is where we're sampling zooplankton. The yellow dots are where we have uh, buoys collecting oceanographic data all the time. And the red uh, spots are where we are looking at juvenile salmon abundance. So this is a very comprehensive study why this requires uh, 150 different researchers to get the work done. 
So with respect to the salmon, or I'm sorry, with respect to the seals, we have nine different studies looking at steelhead and their potential interaction with seals. Uh, up in, our colleagues up in Canada have developed a new technology that I'm going to show you later uh, in the Strait of Georgia, where they have a head-mounted what we call a pit tag reader, or a, um, a pit tag is a small tag that's placed in uh, a fish, um, and it doesn't it doesn't make any sound, but when it goes through an electrical field, the, it can be read, and so you can identify the fish. Um, <clears throat> Puget Sound wide contaminant studies also underway. So here's a, um, a study where we placed GPS units on seals and we also put in receivers so that they could uh, receive an, a, steel, a signal from a steelhead that has actively um, sending out a signal. So you can see that, that each individual seal, each one of these colored dots represents the signals from an individual seal. You can see that they range quite broadly throughout Puget Sound. An individual seal can go all over the place. These are probably on the order of uh, about 30 miles uh, or more, in term, maybe 40 or 50 miles in terms of their geographic extent. These dots that are uh, in the picture on the lower left of this image show where uh, transmitters that have been placed in steelhead are showing up intensively around seal haul-out areas, which indicates to us that this, the steelhead are probably being ingested by the seals and then the transmitters being deposited in the vicinity of their haul-out areas. This is indirect evidence. This is not direct evidence that a seal has eaten, eaten a, a steelhead, but we are actually working to try to get that. So this image some scientists that are uh, working at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver asked the question, can we directly measure predation of tagged uh, fish? And so their idea is if you have a pit tagged salmon and it's ingested by a seal, can you build a device that we put on the head of the seal that could read that pit tag, the electrical signal uh, that is emitted when the tag goes through an electric field, and then send that information via satellite uh, to your desktop. So you could essentially be, once this is in place on the seal, you could be sitting at your desktop and measure pr direct predation on salmon. And uh, working with a computer company in Redmond, Washington, these scientists developed a tool that can actually do that. And I believe now I'm going to go to the video and show you a video uh, of this device taken by a seal named Hermes at the Vancouver Aquarium. So here is Hermes uh, being lured out of the pool with some fish. And you can see that he has a little Velcro patch that's been glued onto the fur. Now this isn't on his skin, it's glued on the fur and it will come off the next time he molts. So you place the trans, uh, the receiver on Hermes head. He's going to go back in the water because he knows what's coming, which is a lot of little live coho. Now the graph on the lower left side of this figure shows, um, we'll, we'll start to show where uh, Hermes is getting, uh, uh, is getting a, a salmon that reads in his mouth. A broad bar, like the one coming up, uh, shows a, a length of uh, contact of a pit tagged salmon inside the mouth of, of Hermes, and that indicates an ingestion. If it's just a, a spike, it's, it means it's a swim by. So if you watch this, watch in slow motion, Hermes is coming after this uh, little fish, got it, swallowing it, it's reading on the pit tag reader, and then it's over. So here's another, here's another event. You can see this little fish here, and Hermes is, oh, got it. Um, it must be getting another one right there that we didn't see so well. So uh, now uh, we're going to show, I think, some, some misses. So Hermes is swimming. Oh, no, I guess he got that one. No, he missed it. So that, uh, you can see that, that there's sharp bars and not an extended one. So here's, an, here's you're showing clearly an ingestion, got one, and then you're going to have a swim by here. So a spike, so you can tell the difference in the signal between just swimming by a fish like this and actually ingesting one.
So now we're going to put a GoPro camera on Hermes' head, and you can watch what happens uh, when when Hermes is actually uh, what it looks like from from his perspective. It's kind of like that advertisement for bacon bits, I think, for the dog. It's kind of funny, but anyway. Um, so he goes in, and what you, what I want to watch you for want you to watch for is that when he approaches a fish, his head will kick back. And what the scientists that developed this, in order to save the batteries on the um, receiver, what they did is they set it up such that when his head kicks back, it turns the battery on, and when he's not feeding, it it shuts off. So that saves the battery, and it it allows for much more data collection over time in the environment. I hope you're all, are you all able to see this? I hope you're able to see the video. Okay, so back to the slides. Anyway, I, I wanted, to, uh, that's, that's really, really amazing uh, technology and I wanted you to be able to see it. And I wanted you to be able to see it. Okay, we did that. Um, so what's the role of fish condition? Also, there is some concern that, that if the fish are not healthy, they may not be able to avoid predators like Hermes. And so we did a study of a, a parasite load of something called nanophyades, which is a parasite that gets burrows through the skin of the fish and lodges in their, their liver. It is typically not fatal, but you can see that throughout Puget Sound, there's a very big difference in terms of the level of infestation of this. The idea is that maybe while the fish are being infected, um, their muscles will will be impaired and they will not be able to exhibit uh, swimming behavior that would allow them to feed effectively or, or certainly maybe not avoid predation. And so the, the steelhead that are infected with this, this parasite that are leaving rivers in southern and central Puget Sound may be at a higher risk or a greater disadvantage for um, mortality due to predation as a result of uh, their their uh, exposure to um, uh, this disease. So a little bit about this project. So I said we have to raise $20 million. Our colleagues in Canada have been a little better at, at raising the money than we have. I think they maybe love fish that much more there. But we've done quite well. We've raised six and a half of the $10 million we need to raise in the US. Uh, just so you know sort of the political situation, there is a organization that's that's really put together by the, U, the U.S. and the Canadian State Departments to manage salmon harvest uh, across the border. As as we can see, as you saw on the map, uh, our waters are shared, and these fish move freely between countries. And so, trying to parcel out harvest out in the ocean and inside the marine waters and in the rivers where the fish return to can be a real challenge. So we have something called the Pacific Salmon Commission which implements the Pacific Salmon Treaty. They recognize this as such a big problem that they provided $5 million out of the $20 million we need total for both sides of the border, $2.5 million each, as seed funds to get going. Uh, here in Washington, the state legislature has uh, appropriated another $1.6 million. And just last month, the Boeing company announced that they are investing a half a million dollars or $500,000 uh, to help with this research, so that's very generous. In addition to the actual cash that we have raised in new funds, we anticipate we're getting about a one-to-one -one match. So the total cost of this effort, including uh, what we call in-kind or effort from folks that we aren't paying directly, is probably clo closer to $40 million. Because this is the marine environment, because this research requires boats and very uh, expensive and somewhat exotic technical equipment like the device you just saw, that was developed for this work uh, to measure predation on seals, it, it can be quite expensive. So, you know, just some take home messages. Uh, the, the director of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife says that this, is, this uh, marine survival problem is the single most important project we can undertake right now in Puget Sound for our salmon. Um, one of the interesting side stories is that Chinook salmon are the preferred food of our southern resident killer whales. 
And unfortunately, both the Chinook salmon and our southern resident killer whales are listed under the Endangered Species Act now because the populations are so low. And it's interesting that you have one uh, a very majestic and iconic animal in Puget Sound, the uh, orca whale, depending on another fish that's in, in significant trouble. I will say that those 80% of the fish that return as hatchery fish are, are also uh, eaten by the orcas and they probably appreciate our effort to grow them. But there is a lot of concern that if we don't improve uh, the long-term numbers of the salmon in both the Columbia River and in the Salish Sea, uh, these orca whales, which eat only salmon, they are specialized. They don't eat uh, seals and porpoises like other uh, groups of killer whales. Uh, their their survival will be at risk. I would. <clears throat> the happy news is is that this year there were eight new baby southern resident orcas born, and so far I believe all of them are still surviving. So that is that is uh, the bright, the silver lining <clears throat> of the orca population cloud that we're experiencing. Um, and finally, uh, we're, we're looking at so many different elements in order to understand what's going on with salmon that we're kind of uh, starting to tease, and tease apart how the Puget Sound ecosystem as a whole works. And uh, along with salmon and orcas, there are other, we're having problems with our shellfish populations and ocean acidification may be affecting the viability of shellfish. This, is, this program is providing a lot of basic research that's helping us to understand how Puget Sound works and to make significant progress in recovery. So what are some of the solutions? <clears throat> well, one of the things that I think uh, is that if we want a, a more resilient population, we need to reverse this trend. I showed that this graph turned around the right way. Now I've turned it around backwards to show that what I really think we need to do is to move in both our hatchery populations and our wild populations to increase the diversity uh, so that we have fish that are able to cope with changes in the environment uh, maybe we we <clears throat> rear our hatchery population so they don't all get released in a big a big clump into the environment. But this is one of the solutions that I think we can uh, look to in order to improve the situation with marine survival. Um, if you want to learn more about this project, we have a very very good website that's shared by Long Live the Kings and the Pacific Salmon Foundation, and essentially has data from all of the 60 plus organizations and 150 people that are working on it. Go to marinesurvivalproject.com and you can uh, look at in more detail uh, different elements of what we're trying to do. Um, so that, <clears throat> that really wraps up what I wanted to say today to you all. And uh, I hope you enjoyed this and I hope you will uh, feel free to tweet about Salish Sea Marine Survival, about seal uh, beanies, uh, about orca whales, and anything that you learned today. So thank you very much, and I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the question is, I'm curious about the overall population salmon worldwide. Um, one interesting fact is that uh, salmon, Chinook salmon in particular, are only native to the North Pacific uh, from Japan, uh, from Russia to uh, California, all the way around, and including uh, Alaska, British Columbia, Washington, Oregon. Um, but they are now found living in the Great Lakes. They have been transferred to the Great Lakes. There's a very robust Chinook salmon fishery. Um, there is also populations of Chinook and coho gro growing in New Zealand and in Chile. <clears throat> so they have been moved all around the, all around the world. With that said, the largest uh, number of salmon harvested and provided for food resources are now farm salmon, and that ex exceeded wild populations um, sometime in about a decade ago, and there doesn't seem to be any uh, real, uh, change in that. Overall, I would say that the salmon populations are of wild populations have been greatly diminished, particularly along in the Oregon, Washington, and California, Alaska's maybe, and northern British Columbia are maybe the last bastion of uh, 
wild salmon, healthy wild salmon populations in the northern hemisphere in the, uh, North America. So we have another question: uh, Are Puget Sound salmon impacted by fish farms in BC? I'm going to go out on a limb, and I would I think that for our fish populations in Puget Sound, that's not likely. I think it is much more possible that the fish populations that come out of the Strait of Georgia and swim right by those um, to the north may be uh, affected. Our colleagues in Canada don't think that's anywhere near as important as changes in the food resources uh, and predation on the fish by on the juvenile fish by other fish, by seals, and by perhaps uh, harbor porpoises and birds. Um, do you think GMO salmon will help with the decrease in regular salmon? Um, here's so I, I you didn't ask me whether I thought that GMO salmon are good or bad for people, and I'm glad you didn't because I don't know anything about that. What I do know is that the the proposal for rearing GMO salmon is to take them on land and put them in what they call closed systems. So you won't be rearing them uh, in pens with a uh, within um, uh, proximity to wild populations, and I think that's a good thing. And I think it would be much better if they could move all salmon farming offshore or onshore into closed systems where you don't have uh, the waste from the salmon going into the na uh, to the natural environment. You don't have the uh, chemicals that they put in there to reduce, uh, and, and the medicines that they put in there to reduce diseases getting into the natural environment and affecting other organisms. Um, and you don't have the chance for release of these farm fish into the natural world where they could compete with the wild fish. So the, the, the landlocked rearing of um, GMO salmon is a good thing, and I wish we'd have that for all farm salmon. Uh, the next question is, are you aware of and in contact with the naturalized rearing effort for Chinook salmon in the Great Lakes? Uh, yeah, we are to some degree. Um, we There's been some really good work done in the Great Lakes on um, population crashes where they, they uh, initially thought if we don't have enough salmon, maybe we need to increase production of the hatcheries uh, and that that is going to be the answer. And what they found is that by increasing hatchery production, beyond what the system could actually handle, it, actually, it decreased survival and they had less productivity. So now they are uh, working on trying to reduce hatchery production and foster greater uh, wild production in some of the rivers. I, I think that's maybe what, what the, question, the questioner was intending to ask about. But we, you know, there's been work, it's interesting, the salmon are native to here, but there's been some work done on population management in the Great Lakes that I think we should be paying attention to out here in Washington State and Canada. Any other questions? Yeah, that um, the the decline of coho. Well, you know, one of the things that's going on in the Great Lakes, and I I don't I I'm going to go way out of my depth here. Um, is that I think you've got a change in the food web because uh, if do you, do you have zebra mussels there? I, th I think that I, as I understand it, that the zebra mussels are now starting to clear all of the potential food resources for juvenile salmon because they compete. They compete, yeah. They compete. It, it's nice clear water, but there's no more food left for the salmon. So when the juvenile salmon come out of the rivers and go into the lake, they're looking for an abundant source of zooplankton. And uh, if the water, if there isn't any, or there isn't any food for the zooplankton because the, the mussels have been clearing it all out, then you've got some significant problems. So um, <laughs> that, is a, that is a significant challenge. Oh, Asian carp in your rivers, yeah. Um, and do they, what is, the, what is the impact of Asian carp? Do they actually eat the salmon or are they, are they um, competing for food? Okay. Yeah, it's amazing. Those are the things that jump out of the river and smack people in the face when they're driving by in the boat, right?
Yeah, so I, you know, once you get one, uh, the problem, I don't know how many of you saw the film Jurassic Park, but some of these biological problems are, are in many ways more significant than um, chemical or habitat problems because they are very, very difficult to reverse once they've gotten underway. You, you, you let the cat out of the bag, so to speak, and the, and the, thing, the things become almost impossible to control. We had a problem out here where our marshes were being taken over by a native marsh grass on the east coast, which, which is a very good thing there, but when it gets into our marshes, it, it takes them over and completely changes the character of the, of the wetlands. It's called Spartina. And we had a terrible time here getting rid of it. And we also had very uh, big arguments between people who were concerned about using herbicides in the marine environment, in the estuarine environment, and people who were more concerned about this invasive grass. And so we had very, very spirited debates uh, regarding what to do about uh, this grass. And I, I think you may start having the same challenges with um, zebra mussels and Asian carp. Do you take very, very dr drastic uh, act actions to try to control those, like maybe using chemicals or something, or do you just live with it? Okay, here's another question. Um, did you know, oh wait, what happened? Are we done? They blast the carp. Okay. <laughs> that could be conceived as a, I guess we could consider that a bad problem. Is that a, do they think that by blasting the carp that that could uh, completely eliminate them? Okay. You know, sometimes you just have to keep doing a, a, a constant uh, reduction action. You can't eliminate the problem, but you can reduce it. Any other questions? Electrical shock rates, okay. Uh, any other questions about salmon, uh, salmon in the Pacific Northwest, killer whales? Um, whether or not Canadians are nice? They are. I was just up there last night and we had a reception at the U.S. Consul General about this project. Is there enough salmon for the New Yorker babies? Well, that's a really good question. So we've had a fascinating and perhaps scary occurrence out here on the West Coast. Maybe you heard about it. There was a, um, a significant warming, a significant unusual, maybe even unprecedented warming of the North Pacific Ocean that they called the warm blob. And... <clears throat> That has depleted uh, the oceans of a number of uh, organisms that, that couldn't find any food. And salmon seems to be one of the species that was significantly affected. So while there was plenty of food to eat for orcas this year with returns to the Columbia River and also with a number of salmon being crowded into Puget Sound, um, I'm very concerned about the next few years what that um, warm blob did to salmon rearing, trying to rear in the North Pacific. Uh, so right now there appears to be enough for the new baby orcas to eat. They, by all accounts, they seem healthy uh, and are active. Um, but I think a lot of folks are concerned about salmon for all sources, including returning to spawn to maintain at-risk populations, including to support uh, recreational and tribal treaty fisheries, and to feed uh, orcas and, and eagles. Can anybody tell me what uh, kind of salmon this this is, the juvenile salmon that's in the picture? <laughs> I'll give you another minute and then I'll tell you. Okay. Yeah. 
It's a coho. Courtesy of Noah. Well, I also encourage you folks to go on our on our Facebook page, Long Live, the, uh, Long Live Kings. Um, we have a lot of information about salmon recovery, uh, and and I try to keep up with the information about the orcas and how they're doing. Um, it's not just <clears throat> information about us. If you want to learn about our history, uh, go on our website, um, and uh, and I, I think you'll find lots of interesting stuff. So the question here is, are you optimistic about recovery efforts? Uh, yes, I am. Um, I'm, I'm just an optimistic person, and I probably wouldn't be doing this if I didn't think that we had some chance. I, I actually think that <clears throat> because of this because of this effort and some other things that we're involved in, uh, we're making progress. So, for example, we have a program in a portion of Puget Sound called Hood Canal, <clears throat> where we are uh, we go into streams. Steelhead populations there have re been reduced by. Um, 80 to 95 percent. In fact, in one river, we got down to only 18 returning adults. And what we do is we, tr our, our staff biologists track the steelhead in the rivers, and we um, watch where they lay their eggs, and we allow them to lay their eggs and, and spawn and fertilize them and spawn naturally. And then we wait about a month, and we go back and we recover about 50 percent of those eggs. And we take the fertilized eggs into the hatchery, we hatch them, and then we rear them for either two years and release them as smolts back to their native river and let them escape, go to the ocean, come back as adults. And we save about 10% of those fish and we rear them all the way to adults. So we have big, beautiful adult steelhead in our rearing facility. And um, uh, this program has gone on for a couple of generations, about eight years in one river, and we increased uh, the salmon or the steelhead that were returning to that river regularly by about tenfold. And so it's a small river, so so 180 returning steelhead is actually pretty good. And, and we've done this in a couple of other systems, and we're having some luck. So I, I think that, um, and there's really hundreds of millions of dollars have been spent on habitat restoration, and our local governments are doing a, a much better job of controlling uh, toxins getting into the environment. And so when I look around what, what what people are doing and the efforts that we're putting out and the you know research like we're doing now that can help us understand how the system works and what we need to do, I am optimistic. Uh, but we just have to keep at it. One, one of our board members at Long of the Kings is a former twice head of the EPA. His name is Bill Ruckelshaus. And he says, um, we need to keep at it. We need to keep at it uh, forever. Uh, because it's it, our actions are going to continue to impact the salmon. Do you have any inside news on progress to remove the snake dams? Um, nope, I don't. I do know that uh, one thing that may make that more difficult, but it's hard to be upset about it, is that the numbers of fall chinook returning to the Snake River and actually spawning above the dams is uh, increased by about 10 times. So we have pretty pretty high returns and it's a combination of a number of things. One, before this warm blob, we actually had pretty good ocean conditions. Not so good in Puget Sound and the Salish Sea, but out in the Pacific Ocean if a fish can get there, pretty good. Uh, dam operations have been altered to allow more flow out of the system when the juvenile fish are coming downstream so the juvenile fish are getting out faster. And the last thing is <clears throat> there has been a, a hatchery program designed to increase the numbers. Now the concern about the hatchery program is, is that going to be sustainable uh, once they stop production? And is the hatchery program, um, the way we do the hatchery program is we allow the fish to spawn in the stream. Typically you don't do that. Um, so you're not, you're not selecting. So when ocean conditions, uh, when we see the results of this warm blob and what impacts that's going to have, then we'll see how strong the populations are. I, it is my honest belief that the populations would do much better without any dams at all. Um, but 
there has been an, an increase in the number. And I think that the, the reason why we had the baby boom of orcas this year had to do with large returns to the Columbia. It wasn't returns to the Salish Sea, to the Fraser River here in BC. It was largely due to a, an increase in production in the Columbia. So um, I hope that was uh, was helpful. I hope everybody um, enjoyed it, and I sure did uh, preparing this for you guys. I'd be happy to do it again sometime. Okay, goodbye.